Okay, everybody, welcome back. We have a special treat for you guys today, coming to you live from the Midwest. It's both of us. I'm uh, Jerry Gonzalez. I teach at Lane Tech College Prep, and I am with Mrs. Allison Malloy from Carmel High School in Carmel, Indiana. Um, we are getting through the final touches of our paper today, uh, taking a look at some of the more tedious aspects of uh, finalizing our paper, looking at our citations and our um, spelling, grammar, all of that little stuff that makes a big difference in uh, the readability of our paper. And then we'll be taking a final look at some peer review strategies for you to further improve your uh, paper. So let's take a look at uh, some of the things that we're going to be working on today. But before we get there, um, Please don't continue with this lesson until you've finished the first complete draft of your paper. Uh, it's sort of difficult to evaluate rows six and seven until you've actually written a draft. So come back and take a look at this once you are done with the first draft of your paper. And please uh, be sure to check out the previous videos where we, where we sort of walk you step by step on how to get, get to this point. So today's lesson is focusing on um, attribution of knowledge, uh, adhering to established conventions, and then reflecting and revisiting, revising your own work. Um, the big picture goal for us today is to have you reflect on your IWA to make sure that your essay clearly communicates uh, your ideas as well as the ideas of others, okay? So looking at um, what, we're, um, what we want you to know for today, much of what we're covering today deals with uh, generally tedious, but very important aspects in writing. So citations and conventions. So um, if you're anything like my students, you probably write your paper and then try to fill in your citations and everything afterward, after you're done with everything. Uh, and as much as I try to get my students to uh, get them to cite as they go along. Many of them put it off until after they're much further along in the writing process. And this can create some problems because sometimes students forget what source they wanted to cite or they forget specifically where in the source, uh, what page they got the, their quote from. And so um, very important, I want to encourage you to cite as you go. Okay, so please make sure that um, you save yourself some time, especially right now, if you're a little bit more crunched for time or pressed for time that you are citing as you go along. So um, there's a lot going on here on this rubric row, rubric row six. Uh, you can see we have zero, three, or five points. And um, so very, very generally um, for zero points, if your response is largely missing uh, citations throughout the paper, or if you don't have a work cited or a bibliography, uh, you're gonna earn a score of zero points for that row. This is very avoidable, okay? So uh, as part of your submission and as part of us just taking a look over, over our papers, just make sure that you are citing as you go and make sure that there is a work cited page at the end of your paper and you will you can avoid getting this uh, zero points. Sometimes um, you may be working on a couple of different documents and your work cited is not on the, on the document that you turned in. And so that leads you to a score of zero. M more common is the distinct, uh, distinguishing what earns you a three or a five for this row. So for, um, for rubric row six, you'll earn three points if you use a generally consistent style, but if you have some errors throughout your paper. So some of those errors might be um, inconsistent or uneven citations. If you have poor or no attributing uh, phrasing, unclear references, um, or if you are relying too much on URLs uh, in your works cited page to really give us um, where your information is coming from. And then for um, five points, our works cited and our bibliographies are accurate, they're consistent in style. Very few flaws throughout the paper, no flaws in terms of uh, what the reference page at the end of your paper looks like. Um, there's really no set um, way for you to cite. Um, mo most of you are probably using either APA or MLA. 
So whatever your teacher has taught you to use at this point, please continue to use that. Um, you are not uh, penalized for using one or the other. Just don't mix them up, okay? So if you're using APA, make sure you're using APA. If you're using MLA, make sure you're using MLA. And you can see on the screen here that there are many similar, um, and they're pretty similar. Uh, there's not much of a difference in terms of how we use them. It's just a matter of what's being emphasized here. So uh, we have two separate citations for the same source, our Kahneman and, and Deaton source here. Um, and this is just a way that it would look in the reference, in the references in an APA paper or in a work cited uh, in an MLA paper, okay? Uh, and what I want you to focus on here at the bottom, the, the two bullet points at the bottom here, um, there are two separate ways that you can uh, reference a paper or reference a source in your paper. You can do it parenthetically, which is the first bullet point um, where it says Kahneman and Deaton. And then there's, uh, for APA, there's comma 2010 or just Kahneman and Deaton. Or if you choose to uh, in embed and integrate the names of the authors into the actual body of the paper, you can also do it that way as well. I always encourage my students to mix it up. Uh, don't just use one way or another, okay? So uh, having a variety is, is, is the marker of an effective writer. If you are having some troubles or if you just want some help um, with how to actually generate a citation, how to make the citation on, the, um, on EBSCO. So if you're using EBSCO and don't forget, you should be incorporating academic works from, um, from this database into your paper. There's actually, whenever you open up a source, whenever you open up a, a file from this database, there's always a citation button on the right-hand side that you can click on and it'll generate a citation for you in whatever, whatever citation style you're using. So in this case, I have pulled up right now, I clicked on a citation and then I have my APA citation here. You just have to be careful to make sure that you are following the um, capitalization rules. Sometimes it gets thrown off a little bit, uh, but this is definitely a useful tool for my students. So I encourage you to take a look at this as well or use any other uh, resources that your teachers have given you. As far as when you should cite, because really this is what the most important um, part of this rubric row is, uh, when you should be citing and what that ends up looking like. So it's, it's, there's no such thing as citing too much, okay? So uh, you should be citing any time that you're directly quoting or any time that you are summarizing or paraphrasing the work of another author. So uh, these two things are different, it's not the same. So summarizing is a, um, a shortened version, uh, shortening a version of what, what another source says and incorporating that into your source versus paraphrasing is putting another source's ideas into your own words. You should be careful though, when, when you think that you're paraphrasing, you can't just come up with synonyms for their words and call it paraphrasing. That is still basically a quote and uh, it should be treated as such, okay? So sometimes my students think that they're paraphrasing and they're changing up some of the, some of the words using synonyms, using a thesaurus. And uh, when they submit it to turnitin.com, it's still coming up as very similar. Um, if that's the case, just use a quote. It's not bad to quote. Um, you can over quote, but uh, what we really want you to do is to make sure that you are um, uh, attributing the source. Okay, and as we said earlier, you don't always have to uh, do it in parentheses whenever you're citing a source. So if you're uh, using attributing sources, uh, phrases, you can say, for example, according to Smith, or as Smith notes, and then climate change is argued by Smith, um, and then just you being consistent with, uh, with the rules of your citation style. And then one way that you can um, possibly save some words in, in case you're pressed on the word count is to use the phrase at all. So if you look at that bottom bullet point, um, ET space AL, it's two different words, um, when you have more than two authors. So in, let's say you have a source with four different authors, instead of saying Smith, Johnson, James, and Garcia, which you can see is kind of a mouthful, you can say Gar um, it should be Smith at all, or Garcia at all, okay? 
So moving on to uh, rubric row seven, okay? Um, for rubric row seven, we're really just focusing on your conventions, okay? So um, three ways that you should look at it. If the reader reads your paper and if they found your paper difficult to understand because of the many grammatical errors or if uh, because of like a bad organization, um, this is typically going to lead to a score of zero. If the paper was mostly clear, so if we read your paper, if we read your paper and we get it for the most part, we didn't really get tripped up on your word choice. There weren't really um, places where uh, your sentence structure was getting in the way. For the most part, you're going to get two points here. And then for three points, um, your phrasing, your word choice, it actually elevates the messaging of your paper. So your paper um, is better because of the way that it was written versus it distracting because of it. And so uh, the, the, the main difference that I want you to pay attention to is the difference between the middle column and the high scoring column. So while both scoring columns, um, you might have a few errors in grammar and style, the high scoring column has an elevated writing style that adds to the overall messaging, okay? So there are a lot of, sometimes, um, you shouldn't use that as like, don't, don't try to use words that are maybe too big or uh, don't try to like over complicate your, your word choice by trying to elevate it too much because sometimes it's possible to overdo this by being too wordy or using phrasing that's over the top and it actually detracts from your argument. So it is possible to be doing too much in this rubric row that actually you actually end up getting penalized um, because it was not as effective as it could have been. All right, so I'm going to pick up here um, on the grammar aspect of this. And so as an English teacher, and you've probably been hearing this since you were in middle school, because hopefully you had um, great middle school English teachers who were really um, giving you the emphasis of your grammar knowledge. Um, but the idea that commas are important and we should be using them. And that is especially true when we are trying to be clear in our presentation of information. So when we think about commas, and I just highlighted, obviously there's a ton more comma rules, but these are the most common ones where we see errors and issues with punctuation. So first of all, if we look, use commas after introductory phrases, clauses, and words. So like, for example, for Ornstein, her daughter's obsession. So after that phrase, then we would make sure that's an introductory phrase. We would put a comma there. Um, the most important one though, Use commas to separate independent clauses when they are joined by the seven coordinating conjunctions. So probably in middle school, you had a teacher teach you fanboys. Um, I remember very distinctly that I had a professor in college who said fanboys was too easy. You should remember it as bath nosy because then no one will ever forget that. But those words are for and nor, but or yet and so. Those are the only words in the English language that are strong enough to combine two independent clauses with a comma. So what you'll notice there is the word therefore, it's not there. So if you have a sentence, and just a, a reminder, an independent clause is a subject and a verb and it makes sense, and you're trying to connect another sentence with the word therefore and just putting a comma, that is incorrect. So make sure you only have those fanboys or bath nosy, whichever term you like better, when you are connecting independent clauses um, with coordinating conjunctions. Use a comma in the middle to set off words that are non-essential. So likewise, there's the intro, um, Mulan and Pocahontas, arguably the most resourceful of the bunch. And then we've got that phrase that's extra information, therefore it's comma off. Don't put a comma after the main clause when the dependent clause follows. So for most of you, what this means is 90% of the time, and it's probably higher than that, um, but for most of you, when you use the word because, you like to put a comma before it, and there's no comma that needs to be there. Um, again, it's not a fanboy, so there shouldn't be a comma there. So make sure you adjust that. As you can see, um, Peggy Ornstein worries about her daughter playing Little Mermaid because no comma needs to be there. And then the one I talked about earlier with the independent clauses don't have comma splices. A comma splice is an error when you use 
a comma instead of using a period or a semicolon. A comma is not the end all be all of punctuation as some of you like to think it is. Um, and I know some of you are saying, well, this isn't necessarily an English class. Why do commas matter so much? Because commas help you clearly communicate. And even at the college level, they expect you to have a basic understanding of commas and semicolons. Um, and so a semicolon is interchangeable with a period. Mulan and Pocahontas are rarely depicted on princess merchandise. That is a complete sentence, subject, verb, makes sense. So I put a semicolon. Then I have the word therefore. Their rustic garb has less bling potential than that of old school heroines like Sleeping Beauty. Again, you do not see a comma there. So at the end of the day, when you're thinking about grammar, how can I do better with my grammar? Learn how to use commas. And if you don't know what that means, again, and I said it in the last video, but Purdue All has a wonderful um, site where they can give you a lot of those extra grammar practice. And I'm sure you have an English teacher that has just been waiting her whole life or his whole life for someone to ask about how to use commas and they will be there for you. Um, other things you can do, avoid choppy sentences. If your sentences always start with this or that, adjust those. Um, and then I know uh, Mr. Gonzalez is going to talk to you more about how to fix up those transitions because that makes a huge difference as well. Yeah, so I think one of the, when, once we actually get the messaging down for our paper, um, one, of the, one of the things that we really want to work on is making our ideas flow. And so sometimes um, what my students struggle with the most is finding the right transition to reflect what their intention is. So. Um, Many of my students will, for example, confuse the transition although and while. And so that's um, on this on the screen right now, what we have here are a bunch of different um, transition words that you can use depending on what your intention is. So if you want to add ideas, we can add um, a transition at the beginning of at the beginning of a sentence that says another or in fact or equally important and then on and on here. These, uh, these types of transitions are made to link ideas or to um, show a difference in ideas. So um, this is, these are tools that um, more experienced writers are going to utilize in order to elevate their language to really uh, jump into that high scoring column for the final rubric row. All right, so when we think about how to put all of this stuff together, because we've just went through both of the rubric rows and now we're looking at our paper for what it is. We want to start with the big picture. What are those big things we need to focus on? And we want to keep eyed very closely on that rubric because that is how we are being scored. So if we drift too far from that, it's going to be problematic. So some questions for you to consider that we came um, up with together based on the rubric. Number one, and one of the most important ones because we don't want to get that zero, is our topic or question related to a theme from the stimulus? And is this explicit? If it's not explicitly stated, that is a problem, okay? Um, are you referencing stimulus material and is it actually used in the argument? If it's used in the introduction, don't count that as a use. Where else is it used? And that is a really big thing. If you're unsure, just make a copy of your document, cut that out, and then try to read it. Was it introduced? Was it used? Do we even notice if it disappears? Um, does your introduction provide enough context to help prove the significance? Um, do we have sources that tell us why it matters? And then did your thesis specifically address your question and do you have a specific position? And is that position debatable? As you go through these questions, you're welcome to pause the slide, self go, you know, self edit or find a partner and then go through and really address these questions. If you don't see it clearly, consider it not there. When we then look at outside of that introduction piece, um, do our body paragraphs begin with a claim? And we've talked a lot about this in lesson six, seven, and eight, right? If you're starting with evidence, you're not necessarily putting enough voice in your own argument or making that a point of emphasis. So you wanna make sure you adjust that. Make sure they start with a claim. Make sure there's at least two pieces of evidence. Um, does your analysis connect the claim and evidence? Do you have more commentary or analysis than evidence or description? One of the things we talked about in lesson eight, highlight your evidence. That way you can see what the ratio looks like and if you have too much. Um, do you have a counter argument? And if you do, did you offer evidence to establish it and then disprove it? 
Do you have your research question? Have you considered it as you made that whole argument? Does it actually align and is it still true? Because if it's not valid anymore or if it doesn't align, that's concerning. Do you have multiple perspectives and did you use relevant and credible evidence to put those together and to make sure and again like mr gonzalez said at the beginning don't wait till the end to write your reference page works cited page bibliography because that's how we're grading uh that row of the rubric anyway based on the use of sources and what you actually include and then we get to the end, do I have a solution, a recommendation, or a conclusion? Remember, don't be those kids trying to do too much. Really know your question, know your goal. Are you writing a position paper or a solution paper? And then make sure you've fully and plausibly proven it. Don't try to take on too much. Did you properly cite? Do the number of references in your paper match the number of references you actually use? And that's an easy thing, you know, just go through your reference page, check off the things that you use. And if you see anything still standing there, then you need to get rid of it. This is not an annotated bibliography. It's not a works consulted. It should just be the ones you actually used in your paper. Um, and then is it clear what your wording is versus what the wording is that comes from other sources? And did you properly attribute those? Um, and then at the end of the day, none of this matters if you don't clearly communicate your ideas. And I wanna pick up on one of the things Mr. Gonzalez said, because as a grader, I will emphasize the fact that some people are just trying to do too much. You go to the thesaurus, you find all these fancy words, you make it sound really, really nice, but it says absolutely nothing and we have no idea what you're talking about. Just because you use big words and a lot of them does not mean you're gonna score high here. It's about a clear communication of your ideas which there's that nice balance between making it not sound like a child wrote it, but also making it understandable. So then when we look at, and you may be this way, but I have a lot of students who love to just get through uh, peer feedback as quickly as they can. Um, and this is the kind of stuff they do. So they write these evaluative things and they write stuff that's not gonna hurt anybody's feelings, but really they don't know what they're saying. So the you know introduction looks good, good evidence good job with your claim right that's all they say they have they have no depth to it but then they can check off the box and be like Ms. Malloy I'm done it looks good and then when I look at that paper even though I can't give the feedback I want to say oh it, it's not good they're missing there's no reference to the stimulus here but it doesn't matter because their peer editor said it looks good so what can we do to be better so let's look at a better example of um, what effective feedback actually looks like so effective feedback actually, and I emphasize a lot of questions um, and clarification. So I like to think of, of Survivor. If you ever watch Survivor, Jeff Probst doesn't tell the people that they're stupid. He just clarifies and repeats the things that they said. And then magically this light bulb goes off in their head that proves to them that maybe that was a dumb decision or maybe that is not something I should worry about. So here, instead of saying looks good, right? If we look at that first one, Where's your connection to the stimulus? The rubric and tax or in task direction say explicit. Where's the connection? I've asked the student, I've made the student think about what that looks like. Then I have all the stuff I've highlighted in the next section. You use outside evidence to provide context, right? That's not evaluative. I'm just saying what they did. I'm clarifying. And then at the end, when I look at their claim, it looks like you're arguing for a solution. The use of virtual cadavers in educating medical students. Is that accurate? The goal of effective feedback is to give the writer food for thought. It's not for you to finish it quickly. It's also not for you to tell them all the things that you necessarily think are wrong. It's to make them reflect on their own thinking with staying close and tied to the actual rubric so that they have an eye on what they should be taking away. So when we think about tips and how we can do this better, number one, and I just said this, is stay tied to the rubric. Base your feedback on what the rubric actually says. One of the big things that we hear in our grade training all the time, and this is good for you students as well, is it's not what it feels like, it's what the rubric says. So look at the rubric and evaluate based on the rubric. Number two, don't infer meaning. Um, if it isn't clear, treat it like it isn't there. Um, and for whatever reason, that makes me think of OJ and the glove, right? If it doesn't fit, you have to acquit. But if it isn't clear, if it's not clear, we don't know, we can't infer. And that is on all of the greater notes when they go to score um, is the fact that if we have to infer any type of meaning, just assume it's not there. 
Okay, we're not putting the pieces together. If you're going to convince us, you have to do it. Be specific and avoid general evaluations, right? Looks good. That doesn't work. There's, there's no strength there. Um, ask questions. Really give the writer something to ponder. Um, if you are the writer, be purposeful and come prepared. I love the idea of coming prepared because it's 2,000 words. We realize that even if you don't have a lot of things to do right now because you're quarantined and stuck, the thing that you probably don't want to do all day is read someone else's 2000 word essay. Um, and so as you're going through, if you can tell them, hey, I'm really nervous about alignment between my claim and my point, then they know specifically what they're looking at and they can do a better job of going more in depth by just focusing on one thing rather than trying to look at the whole paper. 2,000 words is a lot. I totally get that. We get that. And so it's a matter of saying, here's what I don't feel good about. Here's where I want your eyes. Um, and then reflect on the feedback. Not all feedback is equal. And you know this from being in the classroom, right? Um, so if a kid says something and you don't agree with it, make sure you can defend why you didn't take their feedback and then why you take the feedback you do. Because at the end of the day, it's your paper. Um, and you want to score well, but you also have to be receptive to um, that feedback and that criticism. But there's a fine line between the fact that you know more about your paper and your topic than they do. But at the end of the day, if an outsider can't understand it or if it doesn't come through, we need to really take that into consideration. Okay, so a few other points just to think about as we're, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about word count. Um, as both of us know, there are some of you that think 2,000 words means 3,000 and a 1,200 word IRR is going to be 2,000 words. Um, and so we want to keep in mind that it's 2,000 words with a 10% overage, so we're at 2,200. What's your word count? And if you're telling me right now and you're in your head, you're like, I don't know, you need to look at it. Right. This excludes your footnotes, your bibliography, and any text that you have in a visual, a graph chart, things like that. Um, but make sure you know your word count. If you are over, like, and if you are, I, I had a kid one year, I kid you not, who was at 2201, and he was so worried about that one word. That one word is not going to matter at that point. If they don't read anything past 2200, is one word really going to be the difference between you and the rubric group? But if you are over, you need to think about, do you have any unnecessary information? Should I combine sentences? Because a lot of you like to repeat the same thing that a quote says. After you put it in a quote, you then have a sentence that follows up that's the exact same sentence. So did you say the same thing twice? Um, the other one that I noticed is that a lot of you use the word that because it sounds nice, but you don't necessarily need it. So if you file find the word that, that's an easy one to eliminate. For some of you, it's 50 to 100 words that you can just get rid of um, right away. But really keep an eye on word count because we love you all and we're going to grade your papers, but when they become excessive, all that extra writing you did is going to be wasted. We are not reading it. Um, so you want to really keep true. And like I said earlier, College Board's not going to give you 2,000 words if they think you really need 3,000. They're not setting you up to fail. They want to reward you for what you do well. Um, and then we also know that there's a bunch of free tools that are out there that can help. Um, Expresso Editing and Style Pro Writing Aid, those are ones that people in my school use. I'm big on the Hemingway app. I think it's a great app. Um, but again, with all of those, remember that they're going to be looking at a specific purpose. Um, and so keep in mind what they're saying. But those are easy ones that can touch up your grammar um, and conventions and can help you with word count as well. One other thing with flow and word count, there are programs where you can actually put text in and it'll read it out loud to you if you're unsure of what it sounds like or if there's a better way to say it, listen to it. Because in our head, we're fixing errors that a computer is not going to fix. Okay, so keep those things in mind. And then let's go back and remind ourselves of where we've been. So our um, focus for today was to attribute knowledge correctly, to adhere to conventions, and to reflect and revise on our own thinking. So hopefully you're walking away at the end of this reflecting on your own IWA and thinking about how well you clearly communicate your ideas, as well as the ideas of others, and then what you can do better going forward. Next steps, please review your paper for citations and conventions. And if you are one of those people that Mr. Gonzalez was talking about who haven't actually put those citations in or done the reference Works Cited Bibliography page, please do it uh, because it's the first thing your graders are going to look at and it shouldn't be an afterthought. Find a classmate that you can peer review with. And again, if you don't look at anything else, 
look at the stimulus and see if it's connected and what the use of is, and then work on revising and improving your paper. As always, if you have any device or internet access issues, please reach out to College Board directly um, so that they can help you resolve those because they are committed to that equity and access piece. And then on behalf of Mr. Gonzalez and I, we want to thank you for joining us. We have one lesson left um, and we look forward to seeing you there. Bye.